What up? It's Golden Spaces and Odyssey original podcast with Justin and Nat. Feels like you haven't had that much Justin and Nat. Um, but we are here. We are here together now. We are looking forward to training camp coming up soon. Um, it's been sort of quiet since, you know, um, the last time Justin and I were together. I know that he has since recorded. Um, shout out again to Karima and and um, Clathius. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie for coming on and, um, and and stepping in for us. We always appreciate you. Um, and thank you guys also for my birthday shout out. Much appreciated. Um, but it's been relatively quiet. I mean, like nothing crazy surrounding the Warriors or anything like that. So this maybe isn't crazy, crazy, Justin, but Draymond decided to give us a little excitement the other day, right? So before we get to Draymond, let's start with, why Draymond even had something to 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 talk about on X, formerly known as Twitter, um, and go back and forth with uh, someone who's kind of known on Dub's Twitter and NBA Twitter, uh, and that's Ricky Ricky G. And so before that even happened, Rich Paul, in his not so infinite wisdom, gets on um, whose podcast was it? It was the Gilbert Arenas. There you go. Yeah. So he gets on Gilbert Arenas' show, and he's the entire thing was basically for him to hype up Ron and try to like make his goat case, which is like, bro, like we already know what you think. Like, I don't like mm. we know. We know your talking points. We know what you think. And I personally don't even understand why we need to hear Rich Paul say why LeBron's the goat. Like is he gonna tell us something like I, I think it was in response to Stephen A. You remember because Stephen A, like I think previously said his Yeah, no, I know what it was in response to, but it's just like what like what what it, he he we already know where he's gonna land on this and what he's gonna right. say, you know, and I like I don't really care whether Stephen A actually said get the F out my face or not, like who the hell cares? You know what I'm saying? Um, and even if he said it, like when I heard Stephen A tell the story, I didn't even hear that as like disrespect. I heard it as like, you know, like, man, come on, get the F out my face. Like, like the way like two people who know each other would say it, you know? So I felt like Rich Paul's need to kind of come on and be like, cap, and that didn't happen. It's like, bro, whatever, who cares? Um, but that being said, it then leads into a conversation about you know, why he thinks LeBron is gold and ways that LeBron is discredited. And I mean, like, I'm sorry, like everything from that point on was just gaslighting to me. So if you want to go listen to the Gilbert Arena show when Rich Paul was on, if you haven't already, you can. But it's not my cup of tea for listening. That being said, right, <laughs> Rich Paul makes this comment and he says, Justin, that in the bubble, like he talks about the fact that LeBron was just is like that that ring, that championship is sometimes discredited, it, you know, and he's using this as one of these examples of just like how people are unfair to LeBron. And he's just like, if that's Steph, would he be discredited in the same way? Like, bro, are you effing kidding me? I don't even know why I'm not cursing today, y'all, because y'all know I got a potty mouth, but. I'm not cursing. I'm saying, are you effing kidding me? Like, what the fuck? There you go. There it is. See, it comes back eventually. Um, what what are you talking about? Like, Steph is discredited for legitimate rings already, you know? Um, and like, look, I don't I don't do the whole like, oh, the Lakers ring doesn't count for that year. But like, come on, we can also call a spade a spade. Like the circumstances were different and yeah. and like it was it was an easier ring to win and like some rings are easier to win like all the circumstances are not the same for every championship that's won you know so, some teams are just so much better than their competition right sometimes teams benefit from injuries sometimes there's like all different kinds of things you know 
I know everyone who wins a championship will say, this isn't easy, right? This is hard. And I think like teams like the 2017 Warriors, like they have to say that because you'll sound like obnoxious being like, come on, like, come on. Nothing was hard for those guys that season. But, but I think sometimes too, when people are talking about the fact that it's hard to win, I don't think it's just about the final series. It's about the journey over the whole year. It's about all the teams you played in the playoffs to get there. It's about staying healthy. It's about a lot of things. When they say it's hard, it's not just about like, was your opponent hard and could you beat them? Because you have a whole lot to get through until you get to the finals to actually play that opponent. But at the end of the day, like you guys, we had a normal season and then COVID occurred and then there was a break in the season. You guys got rest during the season then you went into a bubble to finish out the season where there are no NBA fans, where you did not have to do any kind of travel. You know, it's one of the few seasons Anthony Davis remained healthy for a full season, which wasn't even a full NBA season. Why do we think that is? Like, you know, again, I'm not trying to say that like their ring doesn't count, but like you had very favorable circumstances. And first, you tried to. Um, gaslight us and tell us that it was the hardest championship ever, which is bullshit. No one accepts that or believes that, right? And then now you're upset that people are discrediting it. And I might just say, and I'm going to stop here, Justin, because I've been going on, but I would say the irony in this is like a lot of that discrediting of championships shit started with y'all. It started with clutch. And so see, this is what happens. You create some shit and then you it comes back to bite you in the ass because y'all wanted to discredit what Steph did in 2015 as though they are the first team to ever win where people got injured. They're not. Like, I always laugh because, like, when Jordan won his first championship, like, key players on the Lakers got injured. Like, not for the whole series, but during it, right, it happened. And so it's just, like, no one ever talks about that. No one cares because they're just, like, he won. Right. Even sometimes when the Lakers like that, they, they always bring up Isaiah and the famous game with Isaiah and how he played. But they didn't ultimately win. He could only go that one game and him getting injured benefited the Lakers. Right. Even if it's only one game, two games like it, it did help. It doesn't mean to me, it doesn't mean that if he played, Isaiah played that the Pistons would have won, but it would have looked different. Right. So, but they completely discredited the Warriors ring in 2015, then use nonsense that happened in 2016 to try to come back and say, see, they really would have never won. So they wouldn't win 2015. They wouldn't win 2016. Then when they started winning again, they said, oh, he has Kevin Durant. So no, let's discredit those two. I mean, 2022 is really the first ring that people on some level give him credit for. And even then there's whispers, murmurs. The Celtics should have won. Um, they, the Celtics were just not ready. They're young. They're in it, whatever it is, right? There was still some chatter. But like 2022, after this man has already won three rings, two MVPs, one of them unanimous, two scoring titles, multiple like three-point records, multiple all-stars, multiple all NBAs, people still try to discredit what he'd accomplished. But you think, Rich Paul, that if he played in the bubble and won, that they wouldn't discredit him? Come on, bro. Come on. He knows. I mean, I think, for one, why are you even bringing stuff up? Nobody even said anything about stuff at all. That like, part. What are we talking about here? That like, part. Like, he why is he the one example you went to? Yeah, why is he could have said if Michael Jordan won in the bubble would because that the, the argument was LeBron versus Mike. So why are you bringing up Steph, dude? Like it just shows like there's some type of like he Steph is always on their mind in some capacity. We we've known it since they since he won his first um MVP and championship. Like you said, they discredited that championship and they tried to try their best to spin the narrative to make it about LeBron even when he lost and try to give him a finals MVP and a losing effort. Um, and then in 2016, LeBron beating Steph became the greatest championship of all time. You know what I mean? And then even in 2017, 2018, it's LeBron and Kyrie against this juggernaut that can't be beaten. Even MJ wouldn't have beaten them and all this stuff. 
Um, so even when they beat the Warriors in 2016, LeBron has the the Steph dolls at his um at his Halloween party and stuff like that. The dead the dead bodies of Steph and Clay and the tombstones and all that type of stuff, making jokes. Steph is living rent free in all of their heads. Like, Condos. It's it's ridiculous, right? And it shows Condos. that they even though they won't outwardly say it, like LeBron will say stuff like he would love to play with Steph, right? He'll never say something like Steph is my rival. He like me and Steph are the faces of this era. He'll give a lot of credit to like Kevin Durant. He's done it in the past, but at no point has he said like, yeah, me and Steph run this era. We got the most rings. Like nobody got more rings than us um, individually. And like, we've been going at it in the finals and all this stuff in the playoffs, all these times we've had these historic battles. We both in our own way, changed the game in some capacity and like, but he'll never say anything like that. But the people around him will say stuff like, if Steph would have won, then would he have been discredited him as if he's like some type of golden boy that's never been slandered or something like that. And then Maverick Carter talking about like he can't guard him or something. It's like it's just weird stuff coming from his camp. And it just shows that there's some level of insecurity there um, when it comes to Steph, because they know that Steph is on that level to be equal or even surpass LeBron for this particular stretch of time in their careers. And they they're trying to find little petty ways to knock Steph off that pedestal. I think that's what it is. Yeah. And I mean, I think that they worry a little bit because while LeBron is still seen as the better player, I would say, um, I don't believe he's the better player, but, and I don't, I don't mean like currently, I mean like right now over their careers, what they've done all time. I, I think that, I I feel pretty confident that when all is said for Steph, like there's going to be a lot of revisionism for him, but I think he's going to be seen a lot higher where that's to end up is, is, is TBD. But I also think that they try to put narratives and things in place. And because I think they worry, I think they worry about like if Steph were to get a number five, right? Because, conversations look different conversations start to change right um because it's like yeah he has the same number as lebron but we find ways to devalue you know some of his rings so now if he actually exceeds then what right and if he gets the six which is what i really want him to do then what right at that point it's not much that can be said uh, I mean, they'll, it'll. But he it'll shouldn't always... have to do all of that, and that's that's the messed up part. Yeah, yeah, they'll end up flipping it. Not necessarily flipping it, but you know, LeBron, twenty years all time leading scorer, all these amazing stats, and he just racked up all the stats and stats and, and accolades and all NBA stuff like that. Modern day will always, yeah, Mark, exactly. They'll always have that to fall back on. Um, but I mean, everyone knows that that's not the end all be all, right? Like. Some some years are just weird where you may miss a few games and you end up all NBA second team instead of first team, stuff like that. I think LeBron, his durability and consistency is probably it's not just even that. It's not just even that. The media would unless LeBron misses games, like a chunk of them, they refuse to consider him anything less than first team. Right. Sure. They just won't do it. Cause there's definitely years you could argue that other players had better seasons than him enough because i mean you just could have right think about the years like when and i don't remember how it's gone the last few years but think about the years where he wasn't even in the mvp conversation right and you had to put someone like an mb on second team or like a Jokic or like who whichever one of the right so and you're like if you had kevin duran or whatever look think, look at the year that kevin and steph both won second team i mean kevin ended up missing games but, like, Steph was only second team because of narratives, right? Because the two point guards were MVP candidates. So once you're an MVP candidate, they're just going to put you on second team. But you cannot really yeah. argue that those two guys had better seasons than Steph, right? You can't argue that they were better players. Right. Just because it was a down year. And it's like if, if, if the media goes in and says, well, we know that Steph and KD playing together, right, means they're going to 
then take away from some of their counting stats, then why are you then holding it against them when they're both hyper efficient? They get 67 wins. And then Steph had a whole ass stretch without Katie where he took the Warriors on a win streak. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous, right? So part of it is that LeBron was always viewed differently than Steph early in his career. And what I mean by that is like, there was always a thing with him from the beginning, next Jordan, this, that. So everything was always viewed for him through the lens of legacy. That's not how the media looked at Steph because they didn't expect him to be as great as he is. That's why they were so comfortable, right? Giving a finals MVP to Andre. I mean, there's a variety of reasons, but they just didn't look at Steph as that caliber of player. So it's like, oh, it's a cool story, right? They would never consider not giving LeBron. Like, it, it just wouldn't even be a consideration, right? And then they would find all the reasons to justify why he should be it, even if there was an argument for someone else, right? Like, they didn't even think twice, right? So, but by the time now he's playing Boston, it was like, like, there's probably, Steph would just have to really no show to not get that. Like, it was like, because everyone understood he's due now, right? Because we've missed some, right? It's the media acknowledging that they've missed some. Right. And so it's just all these things. So it's like with all those, like most of his, and even when you think of like, he was snubbed for all-star in 2013, he should have definitely been an all-star, right? And then when you think of like the all NBA teams, like most of the years outside of, the one where him and Katie that first year where they made second team, any other year that Steph was second or third team, it was usually because he missed a chunk of games. That right. was it. If he played the requisite number of games, he was always going to be first team. And so it's not like he was second team. It, he wasn't second team because other players were ever better than him. He was second team because of like other shit that they penalize him for that they don't necessarily penalize other people for. I mean, like you could remember how we talk about all NBA and we say, well, they're bronze going to at least be 13. Cause there's no way they're going to keep him off. Even though we know he missed enough games that other players probably should have had those spots, but just cause he's LeBron, he's has to make all NBA team. So they'll justify giving him 13. Right. Steph isn't treated like that. Not for purposes of first team, they would probably treat him like that like now, but it's still not like that way. Like LeBron for all those years, like we're not going to give him anything less. And I'm not suggesting that Bron is not deserving. He's not a great player, but there were definitely times and cases where you could argue, but it was almost like, this is a spot for LeBron. So now who gets the other two? That's sort of how the media treated it versus just taking a step back and looking at like three players because it's his legacy. Right. Right. And I mean, this is this is why it's so silly to even mention Steph in that way for Rich Paul to do that. Like, you know, Steph is the last guy who's getting his just due. Um, it's been a whole career worth of snubs, miss like non considerations, and like by the way that they're a part of, right? Because they're in the media's ears. They yeah. got people on TV. Mm -hmm. They're helping to push some of those narratives, right? Um, which. This is another narrative play, right? So you push those narratives to get Steph undermined, you know, consistently. And then when you have your own platform, you make it seem like it's the opposite. So it's like you just keep it going in your own way. Keep it going. Like I said, people can be like, oh, people are reaching, y'all are reaching and stuff like that. No one mentioned Steph at all. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's why it's like. Is it can't be a reach. He pulled and they want to say we're sensitive. He pulled that shit out of nowhere. He pulled his name out of a hat. Like, why, why, why mention Steph in that situation? Why? Because this is a no. This is a thing. Like, it's clearly a thing. And that's why. I mean, I guess we're, we're going to get into the Draymond stuff. That's why it becomes a little weird with the Draymond thing, because it's so obviously uh, a media play, a narrative play that's been pushed for all of these years and knowing that, you know, Draymond is a teammate of Steph, that he's a part of the clutch family. It, it just creates a weird dynamic there. I'm not saying that Draymond is out there, double agent, all that type of stuff, but it just creates a weird dynamic. Um, and if Draymond, no, but I mean, like, let's just call a spade a spade. If Draymond lets Maverick Carter get on something live and downplay stuff and he just laugh about it. 
if he lets volume sports write descriptions that sort of like blame his teammates <laughs> for things, right? For losses. Why would we believe that behind the scenes when Steph's name comes up and you ain't going to tell me Steph's name don't come up behind closed doors mm -hmm. that you're defending him? Why would I believe that? Exactly. Uh, I mean, like you said, call a spade a spade, dude. Yeah, that whole Maverick Carter thing was just so weird. Um, maybe I, in that situation, initially, I tried to give Dre the benefit of doubt because, like, maybe he was just trying to let him get his point out, but he could at least snuck up. Come on, Mav, you know you can't score on Steph. Like, come on, he could have snuck that in there. But people, I mean, he this got man will hard. jump to LeBron's defense. That's another thing. It's like over the silliest shit, and I don't ever see him. Andre but, Iguodala is the one out there preaching the gospel of Steph, not fucking Draymond Green. Not once. Not maybe, not the, maybe, not the dude who claims he would die for him. Yeah, right. And I mean, like you just said, he's had plenty of opportunities. We've seen over the years all of these new narratives come out about Steph, and it's like the moment somebody says something about LeBron, Jeez. it's on that it's on that Draymond Green podcast. It was it was a good, I don't know, it was a good streak of podcasts that he had. One of these when I was actually listening to it, where he would make, literally mention LeBron within the first minute of like each pod episode, like for. Like weeks. I'm really like, is this a requirement? Like when you join Clutch, is that part? <laughs> Of the requirements because this is just seems impossible to me. It, it does like it just doesn't make any sense to me, and I am I just can't believe he doesn't see or understand what it looks like. Um, but he also doesn't seem to care, That's you know. Right. And I see people saying the fans who dislike Dre are crazy, stupid. I don't think so. I don't think so, personally. Like. I, nothing to me is going to come of it, like in terms of him changing, but it's like y'all, like people want everyone to remember all that Draymond did and then ignore all the bullshit. And it's like, at the end of the day, it's Steph. Steph is the sun, the moon, the world to everything to Warriors fans. If people feel like you're sliding Steph, they not going to fuck with you. And that's not just Steph stands. That's Warriors fans right and on top of it on top of it like to me it don't even have to be about sticking up for Steph, not sticking up for him like bro and here's the part this is the only place where i'll give draymond the benefit of the doubt right is like when he doesn't show up and play the way he needs to against like lebron and the lakers right because I don't really think he's trying to sell because I I do believe Dre wants to win. But there is legitimacy. Tell me if I'm wrong, Justin. But there's legitimacy to when, like, not really liking your opponent, you know, um, mm -hmm. when you play them. And, like, a lot of that is gone now from what used to exist before when – the Warriors would go up against LeBron or go up against, you know, LeBron team or whatever. Right. So sometimes I don't know what Dre needs to get that passion to like whatever he needs that gets him like riled up or whatever. But to me, it's sort of like non-existent and you got to manufacture it. And I think when someone's your boy, when they're your friend, sometimes that's a little harder to do. It's a little harder to manufacture that. Yeah, definitely. Um, even for the toughest competitors, you it will. I think most people will be lying if they said they don't go hard against somebody they dislike, harder against somebody they dislike than someone that they do like. Even if you're going and giving it what you think is 110 percent against your friend, if you're playing the next game against somebody who's your enemy, somebody that you don't that you don't like, of course you're going to go harder. Right. You know what I mean? That's just human. I think that's just human nature right there. 
Um, as far as like how he looks, you know what I mean? I think it's also worth acknowledging that he is getting up there in age and basketball age, right? Like he's got miles on his body. He's not the most durable guy out there. He used to be more durable, but now he's kind of getting a little nagging injuries and stuff like that. He played a ton of minutes this last year. So he has to find ways to, like you said, manufacture that passion again, because these are the last few years of him being able to play at a level good enough for him to anchor a defense that can beat a team that's led by LeBron and Anthony Davis. Like, so he just got to find a way to, to work around that. Right. And I think it is possible. And I think it is, you know, something that he can work through being friends with those guys, but it's just not going to be like what it was 2015, 2016. One, because that passion ain't there in the same way. Right. I do think he still wants to win the championship, but it's 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 different. Like you said, when you're going against somebody that you, you know, look up to and, and, and love as a friend and stuff like that. And he's just not as good as he was back then. Like that's just is what it is. So Yeah, but that man talks hella shit. He talks hella shit. And then you expect Steph to cash your bill. <laughs> I don't like that. Stop fucking talking. Stop fucking talking, because you know what? You ain't show up to help him this postseason. For anyone who is not aware of what transpired on Twitter. So, there's an account, Ricky G. His handle doesn't matter. But he tweeted, and I quote, Clutch sees Steph as the enemy. They should see him as a great to uplift LeBron. This is why I don't like Green playing both sides. It doesn't feel right. I get it's business. Bird and Magic was smarter than this. They joined each other to uplift their greatness. They never tore each other down. A little revisionist to me. They had like their little rivalry for a time and, you know, whatever. But then it grew into respect. It grew into respect. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Bird would say things like Magic's the best player in the league or, you know, whatever. But they definitely, you know, the Lakers hated the Celtics and the Celtics hated the Lakers. Um, and honestly, even with Isaiah, the Isaiah was his actual friend. That was his best friend. And they stopped being friends for a long time. Mm-hmm. And that didn't just start with the Olympics and, and, and you know, USA basketball. You know, Isaiah talks about this, but it was just like, it was all good when I was like clearly second to him and like the, oh, but now when I'm winning and we're this, now it's like, you know, and we know that happens, right? That's why I always say like, oh yeah, it's real easy. Like, you know, with like the whole Shakari Shakari Richardson thing. I'm just like using an analogy because people are like, oh, she's grown up and she's so this now, so that now. I said, well, it's easy to be nice to people when you win. Let's see how she shows up and what she says. When she loses again, she wasn't quite as nice when she lost the 200, <laughs> you know, she wasn't like awful, but she wasn't as, ah, ah, ah. and I like losing doesn't feel good. So I'm not trying to say that, but like Steph, for example, is the same person, whether in, in defeat or whether he wins, like obviously you're happier, but he is the same, you know? And so like, magic he showed his ass when it came to isaiah right so this was like real and, competition and and everybody in the league did this with steph all the guy at first it was especially with lebron lebron went to see steph at davison yeah LeBron was at the all-star game talking to steph like you gave my point guard three hezzies everybody remember mm-hmm. that he's talking to steph backstage or something back it's all good dapping him up good. It was all good. Hyping him up. Chris Paul was bringing him to the camps, um, all that good stuff. I think Russ and KD went to see Steph at college in college too. Mm-hmm. He started coming up that climbing up that ladder, start making enemies, and that's just like you say, it's just natural. That's how it goes. People start feel a little threatened, so they they're naturally inclined, or some people are naturally inclined to try to break down your your rise, and that's what happened with Steph. So that's how clutch. It's kind of been manufacturing that 
not necessarily a beef, but like I said, those those narratives uh, when it comes to stuff. Right. And what did Draymond say in response? Yeah. So Ricky G says that, and Draymond Green. By the way, Ricky G didn't, you know, at Draymond. And look, I know Ricky's a big account. I I get that. And like you might see his stuff, but he didn't at Draymond. Mm-hmm. You know. Draymond felt the need to to reply, and he says, imagine overvaluing your opinion so much that you get this caught up in two men lives. Starts using the word enemy, in quotations, to describe two Black heroes. (laughs) And then proceed to falsely accuse another Black man of playing both sides. Both sides of what to be exact? A pointless debate? Okay, listen. This is just not even gaslighting. It's just stupidity. Like, what are we doing here? Like, what are we doing? Two black heroes. Listen, I love me some stuff, but like, come on, we need to dial it back. Hero? Hero? Hero of what? I mean, like, again, (laughs) pulling stuff out of thin air. This is like a clutch specialty. Pulling stuff out of thin air. It happens. LeBron does it too. When he loses, he starts getting random injuries and stuff. So, but <laughs> <laughs> they love pulling stuff out of thin air. Let's make it about race. Let's make it about, you know, that like, what are we talking about here? What are we talking about here? We're talking about basketball narratives that are being pushed, stuff that's being said to discredit your teammate that you never have any type of rebuttal for. That's what we mean by playing both sides. It's not playing both sides of a pointless debate because the debate is separate. We're talking about how, like we said, the clutch mouthpieces are moving a certain way. You're just like completely blind to it. Right. And then this is a guy that that's supposed to be your guy. Yeah. willfully blind to it. And that's supposed to be your teammate, your guy. But the dude that isn't your teammate, you're like just, consistently throwing that the cape on for it's just going to rub people the wrong way like that's just a fact that's going to rub people the wrong way man listen um he went on to say some other foolishness it doesn't even matter because he was just talking like nothing draymond said made sense and it was like really no need to insert yourself in that convo or like even reply to ricky um look the most fascinating thing to me and look People change. Um, Things change. Excuse me. Fans could be fickle. But I tell you what, if Draymond is not great this season, (laughs) because I do not think, because even Clay, who wasn't great, and yes, there were like some fans of like turned on Clay and stuff, but it still feels different with Dre. The vitriol and the dislike, it feels different to me, maybe, you know, from what I observe and what I see, you know, um, and, and, you know, sometimes I try to figure out, like I always say, if things are just Twitter or if it like exists outside of Twitter and I, like, again, it was all anecdotal and it wasn't like this large mass of people, but when 95.7 they were in the Bay in a room full of people in the Bay and they asked about trading Jamon and like the response, it, the whole room wasn't like, yes, but at least half the room was. Cause they did like a, just like by applause, by sound and them, apl- them applause and the chairs were like, yeah, get him out of here. Like they're just sort of over him. They're tired of him. Yeah. We know he got booed. On opening day, you know, after the the Jordan Poole incident, I just never thought I would, like, see the day where someone like Draymond Green, who Mm -hmm. is a part of this core, who is so beloved, would become this polarizing with the fan base. It's um, fascinating to me, and I'm just wondering how the story is going to end. Yeah, I think it ultimately ends with him, you know, Still still playing his career out in Golden State, but he's going to remain polarizing the whole time, I think. 
Um, but yeah, it definitely came out of left field. I just we all feel like from the jump, he was just the, like the dog, the gritty guy, like that was just gonna bleed Golden State forever and just be like f everybody else. You know what I mean? And he, he just kind of morphed into something a little bit different, right? Like I think he's gonna be pretty good this season coming up. Um, this might be maybe the last or second to last season where he's truly. If yep. this is the last season, then I definitely don't see him finishing out his career. Like, because Steph is still trying to win. And you need Draymond to be a certain level for them to even have a chance of winning. Um, mm-hmm. I think one, I think either Clay or Dre is getting traded. I don't think that original core is going to be there till the end with Steph. I just, I don't get the sense that this front office and definitely Dunleavy I don't think they give a fuck about any of that. <laughs> I don't think that they care about, um, you know, oh, the good times and nostalgia and all of that. I really don't. And um, I don't, I don't either. But I also just don't think their value is that high on any trade market. But they don't need it to be because Clay's contract's up. And they could just, they have the money and the cap now to just sign someone outright if he doesn't give them a deal that he wants. And if they, if they win this year or something happens and they become like really attractive again, maybe they don't or, and, and, or they get them like, you know, Dre's deal is now a much more tradable contract, you know? So, um, um, and who Clay will ultimately sign if he does stay. So I just I just don't think because if if you're keeping the three of them at some point, I Clay has to be convinced. Someone has to like go to the bet. Like it just they have to change. It can't just be them three mm-hmm. as the core to ride out together. Even with like the Spurs, Kawhi Leonard emerged, <laughs> right? Sure. Like they're they're. And and I just don't, you know, how long is someone going to, like, stay behind them, be okay? Like, I just feel like at some point, I don't know if it's going to be someone who exists on the team already, if it's, like, Kaminga Kaming breaks out, or if it's, like, someone they go after. But I just, I don't see how the, the they can retire together, finishing out their careers. Plus, now you got Steph talking about he thinks he can play into his 40s. I believe Steph can play into his 40s. Like, there's just no way those th- those two make it that far along with him. I just not being like the main guys next to him. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I think just yeah, we are just based on like age and how how it all works. Somebody's going to the bench, like you said. Somebody may be moved. I just think at the older they get, the harder it's going to be to move them. Um, so it would have to be like they lose this year, and then it's like. We quick pivoting, like, let's go get Giannis if he's available, that type of thing. But if they have a decent season, a good season, and something like that, I can just see them trying to shift it up, like, a different way, right? Maybe use CP3 contract and a bunch of first-round picks or something to grab to grab somebody and try to keep that core intact and just be like, yo, Dre, we're bringing in XYZ. You're going to come off the bench, right? Or, like, Clay, you're going to come off the bench, and we're going to ride this thing out for the next – few years and try to get another chip this way right but i don't know anything can happen like anything can happen like you said i know know him being traded that's the only thing i know right i agree he's the only one but i don't i don't necessarily think clay and jerry that's it like it just like look i already know front offices are cold but when you just like the way that they handle jordan and i get that he doesn't have as much goodwill as the other three but like the way they handled him the way they lied about what they want to do, which I never understand because you don't have to do that. There's ways that you can answer questions and not say what you want to do without just like, well, oh, we want to keep him. Da, da, da. And like <laughs> the next day you trade him and then it's like, and then Mike don't even continue going like, oh, you yeah, know, I didn't feel no way about it. Like you don't have to say these things, but he does. Like, I just think though, these are cold people. Like they don't give a fuck. That's, that's what I really believe. Yeah, I believe that too. I just think, I mean, we'll see how it plays out. I just think the circumstances behind it are just going to 
And Dre had the relationship with Bob Myers, but Bob Myers is gone. And so that's like another thing where I think like Bob felt more of that, like, oh, you know, mm. we did this together. And da da da. Mike, don't leave me. <laughs> he don't got no attachment to none of them boys. For sure. And I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but I'm just saying, because I think someone like a Bob saves Dre or appeal like, oh, you. I just don't know that the others feel that way without a Bob there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think they're safe as far as the front office goes. Um, I think the front office is a little bit more. Well, I can't say they're a little bit more, but I just think they're calculated in a way where they just assess what is the return to what is the exchange? Like, are we getting back more value than we're giving out? Are we getting back equal value? And it's just going to be hard to do that when you shift out, when you ship out Draymond, especially, but potentially Clay. Um, but if a deal emerges, I don't think they would hesitate. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, it has to be like a trade that works that they think that they can win. Um, but like, like, and even if they somehow win this year, I think how they win is going to matter. Like, you know. You always point this out like, okay, they won and then they went like hard with the young guys, but they didn't win by winning with the young guys, right? Like they still relied on their core. Mm -hmm. Um, But if somehow like you get more contributions or it's like one of these things sort of where like Steph has to do a carry job again or something like that and they pull it out, I think that also makes like Steph even himself like rethink, you know, like nah y'all it's time y'all gotta like get me you know Mm -hmm. some people because like that's gonna wear on him you know um so we just gotta see i'm expecting clay to have a good season i don't know what to expect from dre you have like much more faith in him than me um (laughs) it's not that i think dre is bad now i just i don't see it from him on a night tonight i like he's just a volatile person to me (laughs) like his personality, when he decides he wants to show up. Um, so I just don't know, like, what kind of person you're getting from him all season. And he's no longer in a contract year, so he's, like, a little safe um, on some level. So, um, but Clay, he's been working out all summer, contract mm-hmm. year. You know, I expect Clay to be have, like, a pretty good season. Um, I think Dre will be all right. Yeah, you know, like I said, I have a, I have a, a pretty good faith in him. I think he just he's going to stay good at the things he's good at. Defense, that's his thing, right? Yeah, but like we need you to also be like not a fucking person out there who like causes more issues for stuff on offense. And for he sure. does that a lot more now than he used to do in the past. Yeah, yeah, because he was he was a little more athletic in the past, so he can attack off that pick and roll a little bit better. He had a little bit more better finishing around the rim. He could shoot better, stuff like that. So it would be amazing if he can somehow develop that touch again, maybe hit one out of three threes. I know we've been asked about that every single year for like the last five years, but I'm saying, I don't have this face. We'll see. We'll see. I mean, it, it, it really becomes an issue against like very specific matchups. I think against like 90% of the league, it's okay, but um, we'll have to see. I think they got a much more balanced team and they have better players that can fill in the gap to make some of their weaknesses, particularly Dre and Clay, their weaknesses like a little bit diminished. So at least on paper. So we'll just have to actually see how they look when they get on the court. What are you expecting from my guy, Wiggs? Um, one, expecting him to play. That in itself is going to be huge, right? Because he's just – he's the guy that – doesn't get tired, you know, doesn't miss a ton of games. So just him being out there is going to help a lot. And he's in that sweet spot in his career where he can actually still kind of get better. Like he's, he's kind of at his peak, but he can still add a little bit more to his game, whether it be just a more consistent jump shot in the playoffs is one thing. Um, More aggressiveness as a scorer and stuff like that. If he can kind of step into a role where, He's a reliable twenty plus a game score every night. That would be great. On top of the, on top of him being one of the best wing defenders in the league, um, because I mean it would it will lessen Clay's load a little bit. Steph is going to be Steph regardless, but if 
Steph has 220 a game guys next to him, that's pretty hard to stop for any team. So I expect them to play hard, play the full season, kind of come back a little hungrier after last season and, you know, with the playoffs and how it ended with him getting injured and how he just didn't have a ton of playing time in a regular season with his uh, different situations. So it's like a really good season for, uh, for Andrew. Yeah. I mean, I didn't listen to Andre's podcast, the one he has with Evan Turner, but I know Andrew Wiggins was just on it, but I've seen a lot of clips from it. Um, I think that's. Oh. Is it? Mm-hmm. He was on there. He was on there a while ago. I think they just re- the clips resurfaced. Oh. I think it was after they won. I think it was after they won a championship. Yeah, the first. Okay. Well, we'll see. We will see. Um. All right. Let's move on. Um. From this stuff. Um. You know. We were talking about Rich Paul, Clutch, LeBron, and the Lakers. Um, just got a new player. Christian Wood decided after no teams wanted him in free agency to finally sign with the Lakers on a vet minimum deal. Um, how do you feel about this addition to their team, Justin? Because if I were to gauge Lakers Twitter, like they just became super team unbeatable. <laughs> Shit, it's crazy. They got the one guy nobody else in the league wanted. Super team, though. Anyway, um, he's a good offensive player. He's a good scorer. I'll put it that way. He was one of the more efficient pick-and-roll finishers in the league, playing with Luka last year. Um, he might have been the most efficient pick-and-roll finisher in the league, which is, like, pretty good, but he's literally bad at everything else. Bad. Not, and not that like, off, that's it? Hmm? You think that offsets it, that it negates his oh, value? Yes, it, does. it definitely does. One, he's like a well-known bad vibes guy. Every He's like been on a different team every year for like the past five years because despite how talented he is, because he just is a bad vibes guy. For bad one. Bad vibes guy. I like that. Is that a thing? <laughs> is that what? Is that a thing? Did you coin that thing. term? I didn't coin it, but like that's just, yeah, he's one of those dudes that <laughs> apparently rubs people the wrong way, both from a teammate standpoint and from like a front office and coaching standpoint. Um, so that's one thing. Secondly, I think just the the negative that he brings defensively, rebounding, um, not being the best passing guy. Well, he's a decent rebounder, but like defensive rebounding. Um, he's not a great passing guy. He's just a good play finisher. He can hit an open jump shot. He can finish around the rim. That's about it. Like he can score, but like I said, everything else is not just average. It's bad. So if they have enough pieces around him to cover up for those weaknesses, then it's a great signing for a vet minimum. Um, but he's not anything that's going to make me think, yo, he puts them over the top to beat X, Y, Z in the playoffs. Like the people that they're going to need to beat these other teams in the playoffs are already on the roster. He's just a guy that can help them regular season, you know, spot minutes here, or there, create more lineup versatility, whatever, that type of thing. Where do you have the, the Lakers this season? Top four team? Yeah, for sure. They're one of the best teams in the league, I would, I would think. I would put them – I mean, I think the top four – I would say the top three teams in the West in terms of, like, championship um, aspirations are Denver, Lakers, and Golden State. Phoenix, talent-wise, is right up there, but I don't think they check all the boxes for a championship team. They're just, like, a team that was put together literally this summer. Like, they have, like, 12 maybe new players or something like that. Um, defense is a question, all that good stuff, but they do have the talent. But as far as continuity, star power, depth, talent, experience, Denver, Lakers, and Golden State are the top teams for me. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. I'm not buying the stock of the Lakers yet. Um, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. In the regular season. Um Cause I just always think with them, it's always like a. They're one injury away. 
Yeah. Um, okay. And then, like, you know, I mean, of course, there's the great Austin Reeves, and you know, maybe it doesn't matter. <laughs> that Lakers they have him, and he'll just carry if anybody's out. Thanks. Um, okay. So they're USA basketball, they're over, they're over in what country are they in? Um, they're in the Philippines. Philippines. I'm I'm don't quote me on that. All right. Well, they're away <laughs> playing for the US. <laughs> but and uh, they're advanced. They are. They're about to play Germany next. They advance to the semis, right? So it's Germany they face in the semis, I think. Um, but mm. they lost to Lithuania, and it was a whole big deal. Um, which we don't really got to get into this, but it was the whole: Are they world champions? Not world champions? Blah blah blah. It was like a whole debate that raged after Noel Noel Lyle's comments. Right um, about them being referred to as world champions, he doesn't think that they should be. Um, so then, when they lost to Lithuania, people were just like, "Oh, see, he was right." Then they bounced back and they they like really destroyed Italy and um, you know whatever. So, but in the course over this, like they've won, but like it it seemed to be a consistent thing from everybody that like this was their best showing, like in terms of how they played the, the game versus Italy, how they played, how they looked, taking care of business, just this is the best performance they put on, excuse me, to this date in the FIBA Cup. So some criticisms have come out about your beloved coach, Kerr, um, Steve Kerr, and maybe some of his lineups, the roles he's asking people to play, um, you know, everyone's like, you're trying to run the stuff that you do in Golden State, but you don't have that person now. So, you know, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts um, about the way, I mean, I expect Team USA to still win, right? That's what they should do. I know Ant is having like a big time, great time out there. Mikel Bridges just had like a good game. I know Brandon Ingram is struggling, all those things. These are not the superstars of the league. They're like the younger stars, right? So um, how much of it do you think in terms of any struggles you may see or anything like that? Like the fact that they can't really get anything out of like Brandon Ingram yet or he, he played a little better in the last game. But how much of it do, do you think is like coaching? How much is it just like the, the talent like – you know, of the other teams? And then how much of it is it just like, I don't know. Like, I don't know how you put, like the players are playing on different teams. Like that, that they would, then they're not playing like with their regular teams. They're playing with a bunch of new guys. Maybe it's hard to make that adjustment. We know they're good players. So I don't want to say like, they don't have the talent, but what do you think accounts for some of these struggles? Um, I do think it's fit play style, stuff like that. Like, you'll see the bench will come in and they'll just like blow teams completely out of the water because the bench is kind of full of guys who move the ball quickly, make good decisions, move around without the ball and stuff like that. Whereas the starters, especially when they had Ingram in it, have a bunch of guys who kind of get tunnel vision, visiony. Um, and that's just not going to work against a lot of these teams, um, especially with the, heightened physicality and, and the different rules and stuff like that. So it's kind of a mix of like, know your personnel, get the right combinations, right. And it's also a mix of, Hey, as a player, you should probably should keep your head up a little bit more, be quick on your defensive rotations, all that type of stuff. Because like you said, they are a young team, right? I've seen. Why wasn't Anthony Edwards still starting from the beginning? Like why did, why did Kerr think he should come off the bench? I don't know. That, I really have no answer for that at all. <laughs> I mean, I don't think he ever really – I don't think he ever tried to bring him off the bench. I think he might have mentioned it to him, and then it was made very clear early that Ant was the most talented guy on this team. And it was, like, done from there. But Was that your opinion when you saw the roster that Ant was the most talented? Yeah. For sure. For sure. Still think that. Um he could just do these. Where is Halliburton? Because you know Halliburton's my guy. Where does Halliburton rank to you on this team? Um, in NBA terms, probably, probably second. 
probably second. I'm trying to think who else is on this team. Yeah. I'll probably I'll take him over Ingram at this point. I'll take him over Jaron. Take him over Brunson. Yeah. So yeah, it's probably Anton Holly for sure. But Holly's like a Kirk type of player, right? Moves the ball quick, can shoot from from anywhere, right? And his impact numbers are like the best on the team. That I think I saw today, as far as like plus minus stats, all that type of stuff. He's been the highest impact guy. And it, it makes sense. It makes sense. So I want to say our guy, Mr. Reeves, is like third or second. <laughs> We're gonna say it's because he played with Holly. You know what I mean? He's Holly carrying that man. No, I'm just kidding. So what's the real story with Reeves? Is he that good? Is he being overhyped? What I need to know. Both. He's good. He's very good. I think he's a player. He's one of those players that's like he can play with good talent. That's kind of rare. Like, you know what I mean? Some players, you put them next to other guys. Like we see Brandon Ingram, if you take the ball out of his hands or if you put him in certain situations, he hasn't really developed the ability to play off of other guys as good as he possibly could. Reeves is a dude that he can really blend in holding up, handling the ball, playing off the ball. However he's needed. However he's needed, right? He's not the most talented guy, though, right? Like we've seen he's a decent defensive player because he has length. But certain situations, one on one, he can't guard certain guys, right? But you can put him in a team concept, and he can be a part of a defense that's number one in the league, as we did with the Lakers. And he's a guy that has a little bit of juice to him offensively, but he's not going to lead your offense, like be a twenty-five and and six type of guy. You know, so. he's on this team, and our our boy Jordan Poole wasn't even considered for it. So, um, that's true. Right now, who's the better player between those two? Jordan. Still Jordan. Mm -hmm. I think we'll see it. Jordan has his own. He's freedom now. Like he can do what he wants, show his complete bag, his all of his strengths completely, all of his flaws completely. Whereas with Reeves, it's like, dude, he's like I said, he's good. He plays with LeBron and Anthony Davis. Like, come on. They make the game so easy for the players around them. You can run a screen and roll with LeBron and get a good shot every time. You can run a screen and roll with Anthony Davis and get a good shot every time. Are you saying that Steph Curry did not make the game easy for Jordan Poole, Justin? Um, he did, but a lot of their minutes were like not together. You know what I mean? So like he ain't had that luxury. And it's like you're playing next to another guard where Reeves is playing with two bigs. LeBron's pretty much a big at this point. It's it's so much easier when you got it, just a pick and roll partner that can catch everything. You got two of them that can just catch everything and finish everything. It makes it super easy. That's why I, I, it kind of got under my skin when people were talking about Reeves and Clay in comparison to each other in that series. It's like if Clay had Anthony Davis rolling whenever he came off a screen and both of his defender and Anthony Davis' defender drops with AD so he can just do whatever he wants, Clay would have looked a little different, I'm pretty sure. So that's why I'm kind of like, Reeves is good, but people are overhyping him and just kind of undermining the fact that he plays with great players. Right. I got you. Okay. Well, we got some mailbag questions. How many did we get? I want to say like four, one, two, three, four. Okay. All right. Let's run through these real quickly. Cool. This is from Asim. Um, basic question. But how optimistic are y'all with the Kaminga and Moody leap happening? Justin, fire away. All right. I'm pretty optimistic. I've been high on Kaminga. I've been high on Moody forever. <laughs> <laughs> Our guy, Chris Paul. <laughs> our guy Chris Paul and our guy Dario Sarge are going to make the game extremely easy for those two guys. Oh, <laughs> um, and also, even if they weren't there, I think both of those dudes are were going to make a leap anyway. I think they're both. I think Moody's underrated defensively. He makes very sound rotations. He also is figuring out how to use his length better instead of just pressing up on guys that are quicker. And he just get blown by. I think he uses his length a little bit better. He's smart, anticipating plays before they happen. And then offensively, he can stick an open shot, he can attack a closeout, and he crashes the offensive glass hard. So easy path for him to be be good, be an actual good player next year. Kaminga, on the other hand – oh, what were you going to say? Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Kaminga, on the other hand, 
is he doesn't process the game as quick as Moody, but he's a freak athlete and he's six eight, so he can make up for it a little bit. Like he might get beat off the dribble every now and then, but he can recover, contest, block shots. Chris Paul is going to put the ball exactly where it needs to be when he runs a pick and roll with him for him to just dunk it and not even think about doing anything else. Um, And then defensively, he'll be able to play wing guys and stuff like that like he usually does, and he was already really good at that. So um, I think both of them are going to be like clearly better than they were in their first two seasons next year. Okay. And who asked us that question? I seen A A S I N. I seen. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm assuming that's how it's pronounced because it's at is I seen it all. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, and if you want like more detail on that in some earlier episodes this off season, we we've talked about this in great detail. So you can always go back and check check some of those out. Who's next? Up next. This is Vinayak Vats. Okay. Okay. Um, assuming that the team is healthy, do you feel like the additions that we have made are enough to put us over the top of teams like Denver, Phoenix, the Celtics, and Lakers, or certain or are certain things needed to go right in terms of matchup and stuff for us? Who the teams he said? Denver, Phoenix, Boston, and LA. We already better than some of them teams. <laughs> I, I think we better than all those teams. But um, <laughs> so, yeah, you want to answer that one? I mean, we're better than Phoenix. We're better than the Celtics. Like, I, guys, get over the Celtics. The Celtics are. If the Warriors see the Celtics again, they're losing. <laughs> like, y'all should be hoping we get the Celtics. No, I mean, I'm joking because, like, I do love the Celtics. I think they're very good. But, like, they – listen to me. I, call me old school. Call me crazy. No one on the Celtics, even though a bunch of these bogus lists have come out ranking players on the Celtics and Luka and others higher than Steph Curry, those guys are not the same tier player as Steph Curry. If you don't have one of those guys on your squad, you're not winning. So that that's that. Um, he didn't even bring he, that that person to not bring up the Bucks. So that's interesting to me. But yeah, I mean, I'm not really even worried about no teams in the East. Okay. When it comes to the Suns, Kevin Durant is a great player, but Steph Curry's better. Um, and just you know, like the, the, you know, the Suns are interesting because you mentioned their defense already, Justin. So we will have to see what their defense looks like. Mm. They definitely made additions to help with their three point shooting because they are a heavy, heavy mid range shooting team. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll see. But yeah, no, I mean, I'm not, I'm not biting or believing in the Sun um, doing much either. Now, Lakers, as you just heard, Justin is higher on them than me. Um, some of that might just be my hate. I don't like the Lakers or their fan base. But um, it's also just because I just I never know what's going to happen with AD or LeBron at this point now, right? Like there was a time that Bron was Iron Man. Iron Man, we were past that. Like he's been getting injured the last few years and having to miss time. And even when he's not missing time, you he can't you can't get like the most impactful version of Braun in back-to-back games. You can't even get it sometimes with one night off. He, he needs to have like probably two nights off. He needs like time, like more time for recovery. Yeah. I just don't feel like you can get him enough times in a series to do what you need. And that means like Anthony Davis and credit to him. He was great this past postseason for the most part, but I just, I, I'm not believing in their ability to, to maybe duplicate that or or do enough. So that's where I ultimately land on the Lakers. Um, Sometimes you can't even get two great halves from Braun. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm serious. That's what we right. Said. That's yeah. why I said to you when you're just like, they're like, uh, I'm just like, are they? You know, like, I, I think in theory, if they could play like, perfectly and Braun could always turn the clock back but I just I just don't think the other teams in the league are 
that great. That's a big reason why I have them as high as I do. Got you. Well, yeah. So, I mean, to me, I feel like in the West, it's it's Denver. And I think with Denver, we got to see. Because, of course, Jokic is, is Jokic. Um, but you, one, got to see. And I, I'm, I'm actually hopeful because I like him. But I'm also hopeful that it will happen. But you, we got to see Jamal Murray put together what he did in the postseason over the course of a full season. And he might, right? Like, it's going to be his second year back after injury. And just also Jamal Murray's advancing in his career. Like, he did experience um, his injury at a time where, like, he also should have been taking a leap as a player, right? And so now we're here. So the version of Jamal Murray we saw in the playoffs may just be Jamal Murray. And I think this year will tell us. So to me with Denver, it's sort of like a – to be determined because they lost some key guys like Bruce. They, they lost some guys that did help them definitely for purposes of the regular season, but also for purposes of the postseason. Mm-hmm. So um, we'll see, we'll see, you know, what happens with that. And there's just always like you go, you get one championship, you're super, super hungry. And I'm not suggesting that they're going to come back and not be as hungry, but you're now going, I mean, they won't. Yeah. Denver's been knocked out pretty early in the postseason because they didn't have their people. But this is now like it's multiple postseasons in a row for for Jokic. Now this one they went all the way, right? Now you're gonna come back. Eventually that attrition does start to happen. It starts to kick in. So to me, it, with Denver, it's just like a let's see what happens. But I do think that the Warriors can be a trickier matchup for them than any of the teams that they played in the postseason this year. I agree. Um, I I mean, I don't think they played a single team that had the wing, the wing defense to be able to slow down Jamal Murray because you put small guard on Murray, he's going to put him in a post and do all that type of stuff and cook them. Um, He did that to Minnesota with Mike Conley and Nick Alexander Walker and all those dudes. Then, Against Phoenix, you know, Chris Paul tried his best for a little bit, but then he got injured and there was nobody that can guard him then. And the Lakers had a bunch of small guards like Schroeder and, and D'Lo and stuff like that. Um, even the Heat, Gabe Vincent, those dudes can't guard him. Um, Jaden McDaniels was missing from Minnesota. He would have been the guy that would have been guarding Murray. So a guy like Wiggins, I think, potentially can kind of affect him a little bit more than these smaller guards can. And then you need a guy that can at least stay with Jokic and kind of make sure he doesn't give you 50 points. You know, we have Draymond and Looney that can do their best on that. And then offensively, you need to have a player that can force Jokic and Jamal Murray to guard in space far away from the basket. And who is better at that than Steph Curry? Uh, so I think they pose a very specific matchup issue for them. And there's there's issues on the other side for the Warriors as well. But um, I think they are the matchup that Denver – could potentially struggle with the most because of all of those things I just listed. There you go. Who was it? Who asked that question? Vinayak. Vinayak. There you go. I hope that that answer was sufficient. Who's next? So I thought it was four questions, but that was kind of like Vinayak asked like a two part question. And the second one was, which teams do you believe are the biggest threats? We kind of already. Yeah. And so the last one is, what player on the Warriors do you think is going to surprise people this season? And this is from Edwin Garcia. I feel like the kind of answer. Oh, I know Edwin. Hey, Edwin. Hey. Um, okay. So I, I sort of feel like the answer. And I don't know that he's looking for a specific answer, but I feel like when people ask these kind of questions, usually they're sort of looking for like, I don't know, somebody off the bench that's going to be like a this, that, whatever. I don't know. But I'm going to go with Chris Paul as my answer. I think people just think he's washed. I think people think he can't contribute. I think people, you know, and I, and I think it's going to probably be like that the whole season because even if he is playing well and he is helping, then it's going to be a, can you stay healthy? Can you get to the playoffs kind of a thing? So I think it's going to be Chris Paul. And I think it's because like, again, like injuries, things happen regardless, but I think the Warriors are 
I don't want to say uniquely built because there's definitely times all that load management does hurt them, but they are comfortable doing it. They are okay doing it to get you to the postseason. I don't think it's a coincidence that Otto Porter had a season that he made it through and got their postseason. Mm-hmm. He got to Toronto. They tried to use him more, and it was a wrap. Well, the Warriors signed up knowing that they were going to manage Otto, and I know they're going to have to do some talking and getting Chris Paul to wrap his head around things, but I think no team is better than except maybe the Spurs, but they haven't had to like really worry about this in a while. Um of managing players and limiting them during the year for purposes of a postseason run. And assuming they do that with Chris Paul, I think he's a player that can like really help and that will surprise people. So I'm going Chris Paul. Okay. Okay. So my immediate thoughts is two different guys, but I'll be brief on one and I'll go in detail on the other one. First one, no surprise, it's Moses Moody. <laughs> Another reason why I didn't pick him because I knew you would. That's my guy. I'm gonna be brief with Moody. I mean, I, I just think he's gonna have much more opportunity to show that he's actually a good player, and it's gonna surprise some people. He's better than people think. Um, and the next guy is Clay Thompson. I think for the same reasons that you said about Chris Paul, a lot of people think he's washed, or they think he's just not good enough to be in the role that he's being asked. Right number two guy, number two offensive guy on this team. And I will admit he's not – he's probably the least talented or productive number two guy out of all of the top-tier teams in the league. Like, he's not better than LeBron or Anthony Davis. He's not better than Devin Booker or Kevin Durant, whichever one you think is the number two in those teams. He's not better than Jamal Murray at this point. These guys are, like, legitimate, superstar, talented guys. Um, but I do think he is good enough – for what this team is going to need for him, uh, I mean, from him. I think he's going to build upon what he did offensively for the last 75% of the season, right? He started the season slow because he came in out of shape. That lasted about, you know, 15 games or so. And then from there, he was pretty much all-star level from there. He was like 20-ish, 24-ish a game after that. Efficient, led the league in threes. I know everybody keeps saying the same thing, but I think he's going to be, you know, a deadly shooter again. And he's going to have more weapons around him to allow for him to get easier shots and to be better as a ball mover and a playmaker, right? Because last year, he didn't have a lot of options to pass to, so he would just shoot it. And it would, a lot of times, be a bad shot. I think he has better players around him this year, so he won't take as many bad shots. I think he'll be better defensively because he is now two years full removed from um, his injury rehab. Um, so I think defensively he'll be a little bit better. He's going to be hungrier to prove that he's still a good player. And the the, the narrative surrounding Clay right now is just kind of nasty. So I think he's going to surprise a lot of people because the general consensus has now shifted over to Clay not being a good player anymore. So which is uh, ridiculous. It's ridiculous, but he is very good, and he's better than a lot of people think he is. And I think he's going to show. Well, there you have it, Edwin. He's probably not going to appreciate some of my Lakers commentary, but you know, it's all love between me and you, Edwin. I just hate your team. Um, Anyways, guys, it is time that we call it a wrap. I hope you enjoyed this uh, episode. We really appreciate you guys looking forward to the season, looking forward to y'all hearing from us a little bit um, more, but um yeah, I'm excited. I, I'm ready. I need the season to like kind of get here and get started. We, I still don't know who the who the Warriors are putting in that 14th roster spot. We still have some things that need to be answered. So chop, 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 Warriors, chop, 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 season. Let's let's get it going. Mm. But as always, we appreciate y'all for tuning in for supporting us. Um, seriously, we we appreciate it so much. Don't forget to make sure you are following us on. Golden Spaces Pod on Instagram and X, formerly known as Twitter. Um, <laughs> download, share it with a friend, tell them about it. Make sure you are subscribed everywhere that you need to be. We really appreciate it. Um, and give us a rating. Leave us a review. Five stars only, but you know, we still appreciate you taking the time to do it. 
Um, and you can always listen to us on 95.7 The Game's YouTube channel. So just subscribe to that channel because you'll get a notification anytime they put up new videos. And that way you'll know when Golden Spaces episodes go up. Until next time, guys, take care.